quick, a couple quick questions, um, just to make sure we're all in the same room, we answer your questions correctly. Uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, what a RESTful URI is? Perfect. And how about a JSON package? XML? That's what I thought. Okay, perfect. So you're in the right place. This is not lunch. This is uh, <laughs> services, web services, what they are and why are they taking over the world. Uh, my name is Ryan Haig. I am the software development lead for the University of Washington Advancement Office. So um, oh, a number of years ago, I did a presentation that talked about web services. And at the end of it, it encouraged my boss to uh, hire a position that actually dealt with web services. And I was the viable candidate for that position. So now I, I, I build some web services and I manage a few of the web services that we operate uh, in the advancement office. Uh, and Jeff is my co-presenter and he will present when, uh, when he comes up for his, or he'll introduce himself when he comes up for, for his slides. Uh, so here is kind of the roadmap of what we're gonna do. We're first gonna define web services for those of you that are a little shaky on it. Uh, we're gonna do it in, in, in Ignite style, which is shaky for me. So uh, that'll be fun for you to all watch me sweat. If you're not familiar with uh, Ignite presentation, basically it's 20, 20 slides that auto advance every 15 seconds. And if you don't keep up, you, uh, you lose. So uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's five minutes, 20 slides. And then we have another 30 slides that will that take another 40 minutes. Uh, so if we would have known, we, we probably could have done three Ignite styles and gotten you to lunch a half hour early. But unfortunately, we're just going to spend five minutes talking about the definition of web services. Then we'll talk about the future, make some uh, crazy conjectures that, um, that I heard about a few weeks ago that I kind of were in, was intrigued by. Then we'll do a case study by Jeff for Amazon's uh, web services, and then a quick advancement case study, and then we'll leave few minutes for questions, and then ideally uh, get you out of here a few minutes early so you can get first in line for lunch. Um, so I think, without any further ado, this is, this, this is the slide right before the Ignite presentation starts. So this is where I get to take a breath and uh, collect myself. And then if I hit the space bar, I'm hands free for five minutes, 20 slides, and uh, <coughs> hopefully I don't fall off the podium. Um, so without any further ado, What's that? that way, too close. way too close. I know. I, I, I really should jindle it and pull out here. Um, or whoever it was. Rubio. Rubio. <coughs> Thank you. So, all right. Here we go. So, rule number one when you do an Ignite presentation, you don't want to have a lot of text. So, because you can't read all this in 15 seconds. But here's the definition of what a, w, or what a web service is. So says the W3C. What I say a web service is, is it's actually just a simple way for two computers to talk to each other over a network. The internet, for example. One computer asks another computer a question, and it sends back the answer in a coherent fashion. And then the, the questioning computer can actually answer it. So Doc approves. So here we are. We have two computers. They're hanging out in a coffee shop in Seattle. We've got Candace, and we've got Sven. And Candace is like, you know, Sven, do you know what the temperature is in Monaco? Well, in the old days, what Sven would do is he would jump on a 787 Boeing plane, and he would, uh, he, would he would hope that the battery didn't catch on fire, and he'd fly to Monaco, and he'd find out what the temperature was, write it down on a piece of paper, put it in his pocket, come back, get on the plane again, come back, and then write it down and put it uh, in front of Candace and say, here's the temperature, is there anything else you can do? Get back to me in a couple hours, because I've got to take a nap, because I've just been traveling for 28 hours. <clears throat> so. The new way of doing it is actually much more efficient, and all it does is it requires Sven to contact his friend Wilma and say, well, Wilma lives in Monaco, so why don't you just call Wilma whenever you want to know the temperature? Candace is like, well, that's great. What's her phone number? Sven gives her the phone number, and Monica, or Candace calls Wilma and says, hey, what's the temperature? She tells him. Meanwhile, Sven's just hanging out drinking his coffee and says, Candace, call Wilma whenever you want. I'm just going to be taking a nap, hanging out. So <clears throat> what's the big deal? Why can't Sven just get on a plane and fly whenever he wants? So this is an old campaign from the Seattle Aquarium, if you recognize that. But why, won't, why can't Sven just fly? If Candace will wait, who really, who really cares? Well, because Candace stopped waiting in 2006. She doesn't 
She doesn't wait anymore. That's not what people do in this day and age. What happens when every one of Sven's friends wants to know the temperature in Monaco? He can't get on a plane and fly to Monaco and come back and say, well, the temperature 10 hours ago was 78 degrees. I don't know what it is now, but let me get on a plane and go find out again and come back. Who really cares, right? There's, it's light speed. So it sure would be nice if Sven could just say, you know what? If my grandpa wants to know the temperature in Monaco, I'm just going to give him Wilma's phone number. Meanwhile, I'm going to be hanging out on the pool, drinking my Mai Tais, which I couldn't graphically put on there, and, and hanging out on the pool. So here's, here's where all these people are. Sven is the web server, Candace is the, the client, and Wilma is the web service. Get it? The first letter of their names uh, makes sense for server, client, and, and uh, web service. So now we're going to play uh, Where's Wilma? It's kind of like Where's Waldo, but Where's Wilma? In this particular case, this is Newegg. They sell software and things like this. And they've got this information here that's, that's not software-esque. It's actually UPS information, but it looks like it's Newegg information. Well, that's because their buddy Sven is a UPS server, and he knows where all these packages are at any given time, so Newegg doesn't have to actually keep track of all the things. So it gives spend plenty of time to do whatever he wants instead of fly all over the world looking for packages. Here's another example for those of you that are movie hackers. This is the Xbox uh, view, right? And so you have all your downloaded free videos that you have tons of viruses on, and you want to know meta information about it. Well, you can't possibly know all the meta information, but who does? The movie DB or IMBD or somebody like that. So Xbox has pulled in a set of services that allow it to get all this meta information and make this rich experience. Here's Red, Redfin. These, this is a local company here in, uh, in Seattle. And there's lots of Wilmas on this page. We've got, <coughs> we've got this information down here, which is public record information of just multiple listings. And then we've got the map, and then we've got county records to look at past history of when things were sold and bought and things like that. So in this particular case, uh, Wilma got her friends and sister, uh, Winona and Winifred, to help her out to um, bring back a full rich experience for Redfin. So what's really happening here? So here's the data side is on the far right for you guys. And that's what you all care about, because you're all data wonks. And so you care about all the data over there, spends this little consumer here, and then here's a website or a mobile site or something like that. And Wilma's the connection between there. So that's the simplicity of what a web service is. And here are the takeaways. Web services create efficiencies. They leverage other people's technologies. They provide a richer experience for the user. And they're, they're taking over the world, and they've already left the station. So that should bring everybody up to at least a similar level of what a web service is. But let's uh, give me a break and then ask some questions. Everybody knows what a web service is? You're going to get to lunch early. All right. <clears throat> so step two is the future of web services. Um, we know that they're, they're exponentially increasing. I don't have a number of how many web services are being created, but it's probably something similar to how many Google searches are happening. But nonetheless, what, what 2000, what, 2000 or 1998 when Google was founded till 2010-ish was this, this era of search and browse. When you wanted to find something, you went to Google or to Bing or to whoever was your uh, search engine of choice, and you would type in a, uh, a, a search and you would get back an answer and that's how you would live your day. So I posit that that actually is changing. And sometime around now-ish until sometime later-ish, there's this transition that's happening. And I wasn't able to actually ironically find this information on Google. Maybe one of you with laptop can by the end of the presentation. But I'm trying to find out, I've been told by reputable sources that the, the amount of monthly searches decreased on Google for the first time ever, month over month, beginning in October of 2012. And then also decreased in November and December, month over month compared to the year previous. So <clears throat> if that's the case, there's a thousand reasons why. But uh, what I want to do is I actually want to uh, give you all a quick little pop quiz 
to try to answer the question, is search dead or dying? So for those of you that want to participate, I do have a gift card of an undisclosed $10 amount for Starbucks for the winner. And I've got some backup questions in case there's a tie. But if you want to participate, uh, pull out your phone or, um, yeah, I think this will just be phone only because we're going to try to, I think people can type a little faster on computers. So if you have a computer, you can use your phone or you can find your, you can use your computer and just see if you can find it quicker actually. That'd be kind of interesting. So, um, <clears throat> all right, so I've got two questions. The first question is, who is ranked number 23 in the AP top 25 for men's basketball right now? If you have the right answer, or if you have an answer besides guessing, uh, raise your hand. Yes. That, that would be what I would have actually, that's what, would say. that's what I would have said. Did I say 23 or 24? You said 23. 23, yeah, I think it is Oregon, that's right. So how did you find that answer? You did a Google search? All right, who else found the answer? What was your answer? Oregon? Oregon. And what was the, uh, wh how'd you find out? You did a Bing search. You used Google. Okay, here's the next question. So you got that one right first. So the next question is, um, what is the current temperature in Seattle? <laughs> yeah. 43. 40, 43 degrees, and how'd you find that out? Okay, perfect. So that is uh, not only two answers first, but correct answers first. So come get this at the end of the, the presentation. I kind of want to just fire it out there, but I don't think that's safe. <laughs> okay, so what that is trying to, what I'm trying to illustrate with that is that the weather app is consuming a service from some weather station. Undoubtedly that, you know, weather.com or the federal government or somebody uh, actually um, controls, and they push it out to all these places. So if I, if I wanted to put on my website, the current temperature is 43 degrees, I could go get that service, consume it, present it onto a web page in any fashion I wanted. But what's happening is the first question was a hard question that's very specific to a situation. Top 25 AP poll and a, a particular number on that, uh, that ranking. The second question is, is something more generic that we all probably have, most of us have if we have a, a phone that supports apps, we probably have a weather app. And so what's happening is data is really becoming the king of all of this. So if search and browse is slowly dying in replace of apps and the simple one touch way of, of getting information from, uh, from your phone, then what happens is your jobs for those of you that are data people, is becoming more and more important. So luckily, uh, that's good news that I think you probably already knew because um, that's why you're in that job and it's a nice, safe job. So here's the, uh, the diagram that I went through in 15 seconds, but we'll slow it down a little bit and we can talk about in the weather situation what we've got. So the provider is just one of these ones on the far right. The provider is pick your weather source data. There's only so many thermometers that are gonna read 43 degrees or maybe 42.6 or 44 or something like this. Um, but there, that's the data side of it. And what we've got is then now this consuming server is living out there somewhere and serving information what used to be to a client facing website. So this was Candice at the coffee shop and replacing it with a mobile app now. So everything is staying the same except for the new technology, the mobile app, is being replaced. So in 10 years when mobile apps die and it's, it's something else, then everything else will, for the most part, we think, will stay uh, relatively intact and the next technology will slide up and take over the, the mobile app sphere. So um, we all know that there's this insatiable appetite for very specific data at a very specific moment in time. And that's 
that's becoming ever more present as, as we all are looking on Facebook and Twitter and these, these real-time systems and we start to get frustrated that there's no new activity. There's this, this wave of momentum moving in the direction of, I don't actually care what the temperature was five minutes ago. I wanna know what the temperature is right this minute. Uh, and, and a lot of that is being supported through web services uh, or Wilma as this is, uh, this is talked about. So uh, in about 2002, Amazon realized this momentum well before a lot of the rest of us and they started to build out a whole framework and an infrastructure of, of web services. So uh, Jeff will uh, come up and talk about the, the Amazon case study and where they're where they are and where they're going with, with their web services. And then I'll come back and make up some more slides to close out. All right, I promise not to speak as fast as Ryan did during the, uh, the five minutes. That was awesome, by the way. That, that is not easy. I've done those presentations before. They are not easy to do at all. So big hand for Ryan for doing that. that that's awesome. Work. That awesome job. So uh, my name is Jeff Barr. I am a principal evangelist for the Amazon Web Services and have been in my job for about 10 years and came in in a very, very interesting way that it's totally relevant to, uh, to, to what we, we just heard. So um, I, I worked for Microsoft from 1997 to 2000. And back then I worked on very, very early web services. If you remember things like um, UDDI directories and SOAP and WSDLs and things like that, I, I worked in those very, very early. I, I was a I believe in those things a lot. It sounds like a really, really interesting technology. I, I told variations of the, the Candace and Sven and Wilma story many, many times. And at, at way back then, people were really skeptical. You talk about this idea of, of client applications connecting up across the internet to some cool services somewhere else. You, you would tell that story to people and um, they'd kind of listen and they'd shake their head and say, yeah, that." That could happen, but you know, I'm, I'm not super convinced about all that just yet. So, so I, I left Microsoft and worked for some, for some VCs for a while and uh, somehow ended up doing this, the same thing. I ended up working with a bunch of tool companies that were building SOAP tools and UDI, direct, UDDI directories and the same thing. And we'd go out and we'd try to tell the same story again and again. And again, people would shake their heads and say, yeah, I could see that, but I'm kind of skeptical about it. And so um, at, at some point in 2002, I, I logged into my Amazon account one day and this little box popped up on the side and it said, Amazon now has XML. I'm like, wow, XML, I know what that's all about. I've been working with that for a while. <laughs> Clicked on through to see what it was all about and saw that, that Amazon had actually taken the Amazon product catalog and had enabled it to be web service accessible Basically, what we'd been talking about and what you heard about earlier here, the things I'd been talking about and thinking about and trying to convince the world for a while, totally unsuccessfully, that that, that was the future. I finally saw something that was a little bit more, more interesting and business relevant than, than a stock quote or the weather or a little string that just said, hello world. So I, I saw that, that, that first web service. I immediately downloaded it, got a bunch of experience with it, write, wrote back to the team at Amazon and said, this is pretty awesome, but I have some ideas to make it even more awesome. They were super, super receptive to that, to that, uh, that message. I, you know, long story short, I ended up being on that team that did it within about a month after that first email. And so I, I actually um, started out on that team and they said, you know what, well, now that you're here, we want you to help make these services succeed. We've got some conferences for you to speak at. They started sending me out to some conferences and before long they said, well, you are now the official Amazon Web Services evangelist. And uh, 10 years later, it's been a, a bunch of fun to just go out and speak to groups all around the world and just tell them what we're doing at Amazon with, with our line of services, which we now call AWS. At a, at a certain point along the way, we'd launched that first service. We saw developers using it and we said, you know what, if developers like that catalog service, maybe there's other services we can offer. So let's kind of go through the story of kind of uh, from, from that as a starting point, let's think what does it take to be an online retailer? Well, people kind of think from the outside in generally, you kind of think, well, you, you need a really, really cool website and certainly that's an easy and obvious thing to do. Totally, totally obvious there. But then you think, well, I need some kind of fulfillment center behind there to ship goods to, to the people that make purchases. This actually is a real picture of just one of our many um, fulfillment centers. We have, we have dozens of buildings of this size at, at different locations around the world. 
But then there's this not so obvious part. You actually need a whole bunch of IT behind that. So we've been working on, on the, all, all the IT behind the website for, for quite a while. We thought we were pretty good at it, but we still couldn't move the business as fast as we wanted to, because you'd, you'd, want, you'd go to IT and say, I need to expand my business, I need more servers, I need more storage, and typical IT says, that's great, we'll put that on the schedule, we'll get on the budget, we'll slowly ramp the, into that over time. So we started to improve our own internal processes, figure out ways that we could actually get IT resources to our internal teams more quickly, um, more efficiently and to put some automation into place so that they didn't actually have to put numbers in spreadsheets and go to budget meetings and planning and, and all the like. And kind of concurrently with this, as we're figuring out ways to automate and make our own IT infrastructure more efficient, we, we put out this first web service. Within about 24 hours after the launch, that we, we had people like me responding and saying, this is really, really cool, really interesting. But we had developers taking that service and building actually interesting tools and visualizations of the Amazon product catalog doing neat things that we'd never thought of, never really anticipated. So we got this really early clue that said, if you put raw data, if you put powerful services into the hands of software developers, if you give them the technology and the license and the business model, they're gonna actually put a lot of creativity and ingenuity and they're gonna invent awesome things with, with what you give them. So we saw this unfulfilled need. We said, well, maybe we can actually do other things for them. So we, we kind of took that initial foray. We then said, Let's, is there a broader mission here? And so Jeff Bezos is always encouraging us to kind of see the future and invent things to kind of you know, meet people's needs. And so we, we kind of thought about that for a bit and came to this broader mission. Can we enable businesses and developers to use web services to build scalable and sophisticated applications? After lots and lots of work, we started launching a, a line of products that have, have grown over the last years into what we call the Amazon Web Services, or, or AWS. The industry that we, that we are part of is now commonly called cloud computing. That, that name didn't really stick at first. It, it was actually a while into this effort before people really started calling it cloud computing. But we, we've come up with some pretty interesting attributes to, to the cloud as it's, as it's kind of gone from the, the web service space and where you're activating all these remote things uh, uh, over the internet to the point where now we can actually do things like launching servers and storage and networks in, in the cloud. Um, these are the things that people really seem to like about it. No upfront costs, so you're, you're not paying in advance for data centers and storage and servers and so forth. Low cost because you're taking advantage of, of economies of scale that your provider is able to, uh, to, to realize because they're serving you and hundreds of thousands of other customers. Paying only for what you use, so you, you don't have to buy servers up front and without the ability to predict exactly how much you need. Self-service, so you don't need to call up IT and deal and negotiate and talk to them. You simply go to a, a self-serve console, say, I need this much of whatever resource, hit the button and launch it and away you go. Scaling up, scaling down, so you can deal with changes in your, your requirements. And then the net result of all this is better agility. You can move more quickly. You can get your products out to market more quickly. So I, I kind of character this as last generation IT. Someone overworked, perhaps uh, great with technology, maybe not great with people, but almost always your, your route to actually getting more IT services. So this is, this is the, the classic last generation IT person that we all, we've either all been that person or had to deal with that person. Cloud generation, by contrast, you pull up a web form, select the kind of resource you need, fill it in, and for example, you, you need to launch a, a server, you need to launch a database, create a network, fill in the form, and away you go, you've got that resource available to you in seconds or minutes. Ooh, a little bit of a font issue there. That's not so good. Ooh, okay, I'm not, okay, there's not a whole lot of in there. Great, good. Okay, so we kind of have like last generation versus cloud generation here. Last generation, you're dealing with your IT department, lots of manual work. The time frames you think about are hours, days, and weeks. There's a lot, because it's manual, it's often error prone, and it's relatively small scale. You can reasonably ask your IT department for one servers, five servers, 10 servers, probably not a thousand servers or 10,000 servers. The cloud generation, on the other hand, we've got empowered users that can actually do a lot more self-serve. More automated, scripted setup, quite often you can make use of APIs to both launch your individual cloud resources and then to set them up and configure them and to connect them up, They're totally automated. We're talking seconds and minutes as our basic time frames. And then because it's automated and all accessible to you via APIs, it, it's all scripted and repeatable. So you can, if, if you need those 10,000 servers, you can actually, you can all make them all be set up the exact same way. 
So our, our platform is called AWS, the Amazon Web Services. I'm not gonna go into tons and tons of detail. There, there, there are multiple services inside each of those interior boxes. I could probably spend two hours giving you a, a brief overview of what's there. Um, infrastructure, foundation services, platform services, management administration, and then all these are different resources you can use to build your own application. Uh, very, very briefly, uh, just a couple services here I'll talk about. The first one I'll, I'll tell you is called EC2, the Elastic Compute Cloud. Virtual servers in the cloud. You can provision and boot up new servers in, in minutes. You can run Linux or Windows on these servers. You have a, a choice of 18 different instance types, varied amounts of CPU power, RAM, local disk, network speed, and so forth priced from a couple pennies per hour for the very, very smallest up to dollars per hour for extremely powerful servers. The cool thing here is that if you need a few of these for a long time, you can get that. If you need a bunch of them for a short time, you can do that. You can very, very easily trade off amount of processing time versus how many servers you'd wanna launch. If you have scalable algorithms, if you can e exploit parallelism, you can say, well, I'm running at a certain speed on 10 servers, I need it in one tenth the time, I'll just launch 10 times as many servers, get that job done 10 times more quickly. Uh, if you need databases, we have something called the Relational Database Service, makes it super easy to launch MySQL, Oracle, SQL Server databases. You don't call up IT, you don't wait days or weeks or months to get a server assigned and OS installed and database installed. You fill out the form, you say go, you've got a, an entire database up and running in a couple of minutes. So people take these services and they actually build very, very complex architectures with them. We have some really cool architecture diagrams available on our website if you wanna build, for example, a web application with, with multiple tiers of servers, databases, load balancing, um, DNS, content distribution, all those are different services you can basically select from the, the catalog and say, these are different ways I can put them together, build my site. Uh, online gaming, very, very popular. Very, um, if you ever have to do an online game, you'll find that you typically go from zero users to a few users to multiple millions of users, often in the space of a couple months. And just as, as quickly as you get that massive ramp up and everything's going awesome, the, the people find someone else, to, some other cool game, and your traffic will either level or even start to decline. So the, the cloud model turns out to be awesome for, for, for the online gaming use case because of this great ability to scale up, scale down. Maybe you have users that are mostly active on the weekends or in the evenings or in one particular time zone. You can shift around the world. You can launch more things in the afternoon than in the morning. You can very really adjust and adapt to uh, two particular circumstances. And with that, let's go back to Ryan for our, our UW case study. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I think one thing that was implied in that presentation was uh, that everything you could see on any of those web pages is actually triggering a web service to do the work. Is that right, Jeff? Exactly. Yeah. So uh, anything that you see on the on the page that you can click on, you can actually call from a script as well, either within your code or uh, from a command line or something like that. So you can bring up a, you can bring up ten thousand servers literally with uh, a line of code, and it will happen in just a matter of minutes. So pretty impressive stuff. Uh, if you want to see really impressive stuff, here's some of the stuff that uh, I've been working on. This is uh, much smaller scale. This, this was, um, we had a company that wanted to offer additional incentives to people that were alumni association members for the University of Washington. Um, and instead of calling the alumni association or traveling to the alumni association like Sven would have done in the old days, they wanted some kind of a web service, and so uh, I was on the hook to, to write a relatively simple web service that, uh, that did uh, some pretty simple data aggregation from our member data, so that was using a store procedure to, to get a data set. Um, as Kirk mentioned earlier, don't give out information that isn't used, so we had a pretty small uh, set of data that, that made a member object and then we push that to the, the web service and then a, an Android app or an iPhone app or a website was able to consume that. Um, and here is basically, this is a RESTful URI, so for the six people in the room that uh, are familiar with what this looks like or what this actually does, this is, this is, this is the code that you would, you would make. Um, feel free to take a picture of it. It's actually only gonna give you information about one person and uh, that, SHA-512 hash at the end won't get you much further. 
Um, and you're going to get to see the payload anyway. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. But the, the dissection of what this call does is there's, there's sort of four unique pieces in this particular uh, RESTful URI. The first is just the base, the base address, and that's, that's where we put it on our server. The thing to note is in the red is this V2. So we also have a V1 that is slightly different. You'd have to see the documentation on how to make that call. And V2, you would look at the documentation for V2 to make this particular call and be able to format it in the way that it needs to be formatted. Uh, and then when we write V3, then you would just call the, the V3 version and everything stays in line. So if you, if you are a consumer of the service and you don't want to upgrade to version two because something um, is either too hard for you to implement or you're getting the data that you want or you don't want to get additional features, then just stay with the URI of V1. If you're ready to move up to V2, go to V2, and then when V3 comes out, you just move that, which makes it really nice for developers. We don't have to send out software that you have to install or something. It's just simply change the base URI. The next one is a unique ID for a vendor. So this is just a, a hash, a random uh, GUI, uh, GUID for, for a vendor. So we give all of our vendors that consume our services, we give them a unique ID. Um, so that we can see their activity and we can actually control their security permissions and what sort of a payload we return to them based on the relationship that vendor has with the application that they're calling. So they can uh, then come in and we can actually, we can take away their permission with a, by just changing a single flag in the database or um, give them more robust, a, a more robust payload if that's what they need. And then the next part is the member that you're looking for and so this particular situation uh, the member ID is, is seven. It's the lowest number that we have in our database that is an active alumni association member. Uh, and then we hash the entire request uh, with a signature. So what this does is this is that uh, measure of security that what we do is we take the entire URL, URI from here all the way to where, uh, right before the ampersand at signature. And we take that and then we append the vendor's private key to it and then we hash it with SHA-512, which uh, I'm sure the security experts in the room will probably say has been hacked by now, um, but uh, it's, it's easy to implement and uh, it's a pretty high level of security for something as simple as uh, an alumni association uh, payload. So we, we, we hash that and, and the goal is that we should get the same signature as it's passed in the URI. So the vendor does the exact same thing on their end. They know their secret key. They take the URI up to the ampersand of signature and they hash that with SHA-512 and their signature should equal our signature. If it doesn't, you get an error message. Um, so I have, I have a demo of this in the wild. Um, I'm not sure if I can get this over to that monitor, but let's see which way it is. I'll just throw it on top and then see what happens. So here's, uh, here's that URI in the wild. You could, um, you could potentially all hit it uh, until I turn, off or turn on the firewall so you can't actually see dev website one. Um, but this is, this is that URI that I, that I showed you. And then here's the payload that comes back. And this is a JSON package uh, that, that's returning. And um, I will actually, that's the next slide. So. Just wanted to show you all that it actually is working in the wild, or at least I can make it look like it's working in the wild and you would all believe me. But that's an actual web browser that is working. And hopefully I didn't give you too much time to uh, copy down the, the URI. But you'll get these slides and then you'll probably go hack it anyway. So here's the response that comes back. And this is, um, so the name of the service is the UWA member check results. So you, that's the, the top. Uh, part of the payload so that you know you're getting the right thing back. If there was an error, it would say what the error message was. And if it's successful, then it returns an actual member. And it's got the member first name and the, the ID number, their last name. The status is active. There's no expiration because membership type LS means lifetime single member. So they, um, they, they have a lifetime membership that just doesn't expire. So that's, um, that's the payload. And if you were to want, if you wanted to, uh, find out what member ID eight was, you would have to know the vendor's secret ID so you could make that hash to create a signature that we would then validate against to make sure it works. So um, you could find out this person's first name and last name 
but um, I don't think she's in the room, but I'm pretty sure she wouldn't care. <clears throat> All right, um, so here's basically uh, the, the path that this particular, the demo that I just did took. It takes uh, the member data, throws it through a web service, and returns it out to uh, a website. So you could, the other, the other ones that were there were iPhone app and Android app. It's all a JSON package, easily parsable with any of your modern languages, uh, including JavaScript, because it's actually JavaScript is what J and S stands for in JSON. Um, so that, that's that. Uh, and that is actually the end of the presentation here. Are the, the highlights of what we, um, what we talked about is, is that web services uh, definitely create efficiencies. You don't have to do as much programming. Um, they leverage other people's technologies. I don't actually have to find out uh, how to write a weather app. I can just go steal somebody else's. Um, for some reason, that auto advanced. It must think I'm still igniting. Uh, and uh, it provides a richer user experience. They're becoming ubiquitous. Uh, data is obviously becoming more and more valuable. So protect it. Use it sparingly. Your jobs are, of course, important. There's this insatiable appetite to uh, get this very specific data in a very uh, real-time uh, moment. And if you're not doing web services, it's probably time to, to interface with somebody that is because the train uh, left the station about 2002 and it's well on its way to, uh, to hopefully not derailing somewhere in the middle of the country and spilling grains, corn all over. So, um, so that's it. We're a few minutes ahead of time, but we've got uh, we have plenty of time for questions, and we have some questions for you if you don't have questions for us. So, Jeff, if you want to come up and get mic so you can answer this for the recording, that would be good. Any questions? Yes. Can you talk more about what, um, what other applications you use for deploying your, your data and consuming data? Well? What other applications we well, use? Well, I mean, web services for? Um, yeah, certainly. So in the UW specifically, we, um, there's, well, UW specifically actually has a whole web services team and they, they share information about classes. So you can actually write a service about what classes, or you can write an application that consumes the class service and it actually brings back how many people are registered. Um, if you have permission, actually the, uh, the ID numbers of who those people are and then there's a, a person service that will actually bring back a, ro a very robust payload of who a person is in any number of, of databases across uh, across campus. Uh, UW Advancement specifically, we're, we're working on some services. Uh, we're making the member service better for some new vendors that are coming on and want to know more information about that. Uh, and then we're actually using some internally for disparate systems. So we're a C-sharp shop for the most part. But there's some people that are writing PHP that want to consume some information about who the people are that work in advancement. And so we're writing a service that they can, they can consume uh, in real time. So when it changes in the database, it would change on the, on the website and, it, and they don't have to ever touch their website to update the directory and, and things like that. So that's a, a handful of examples. But if, uh, if you have specific, like if you're trying to do something and you want to know uh, what the feasibility is, touch base with me afterwards. I'd be happy to. Jeff, you guys are just everything that Amazon does is web services. <laughs> yep. Other questions? Yeah. Just a simple question on the routine you're showing. Where, where does the vendor get your member ID from? Okay, yeah. So in that particular situation, it's uh, for an iPhone app, and they ask the question. So if you log in and you identify yourself as an alumni association member, it says, what is your member ID? And so they would say seven is my member ID. Um, and then they would go out to the service, make a call to see if number, I, number seven. And then what's nice about this is we actually send back the full payload with first name and last name. And then if they choose for their application's sake to validate that it's not just somebody putting in number seven, number eight, number nine, trying to find out what number works, uh, they can then secondarily validate it with a last name. So we pass the last name and then they can say, what's your member ID and last name? And then you can see the round trip comes back and then they can validate Smith to Smith with number seven.
Are any of you using services? Besides people that work in our department? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm using somebody else's service. I didn't realize it was a web service. Yeah. They called it an API. It's analogous. Right. Yeah. That's why I came here. What the heck? <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I guess that should have been the first slide. And a web service is an API. I mean, I'm sure that somebody is going to tell me that there's some small differences, but for the most part, they're the same. What other, somebody else was using web services. How are you using them? Oh, we're using them to serve the data from our um, database uh, to fill out forms. So they yeah. auto populate the search. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So great. Where are you at? Uh, Rochester. Rochester, yeah. That's, events is huge on, on campus. We struggle with trying to figure out a, a central repository to put events into so that at any given time we can get what's happening right now, right here. And it, it's a very hard question to answer when our camp, uh, 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 on the UW campus anyway. You need some cloud. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we need people to populate the cloud. <laughs> Anything else? Siri, yes? Do you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, Siri is a web service. That's a great example, thank you, of a, of a web service. <laughs> it's coming from advance, yeah. I think we, yeah, we have a replicated table that, uh, or a denormalized table that we bring down a bunch of member information Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. All right. That's it. Go get in line for lunch. <laughs>